certain scholar has examined entire Bible, and he wanted to find out how many God's promises were in the Bible. And he claimed that there were 3,573 promises. But other scholars said, no, it's more than that. Some say it's above 7,000, and some say above 8,000 promises of God in the Bible. Or some say we cannot count. There are so many and so numerous, it's impossible to count the number of God's promises in the Bible. So God is promise giver. God gives us many, many promises to us. And He's a faithful God, and He always keeps His promises. No matter what happens in life's situation, no matter what happens in universe, there might be some chaos going around. But if He gave me the promise to fulfill that promise, He can maneuver entire universe and He will keep the promise that He has given to me. That much our God is the promise keeper. Now, as we live in this life as a people, we also make promises. You know, However, we are not like a powerful as our God is. So oftentimes we fail to keep that promise. As I get older, no, as I get maturer, <laughs> I tend to be more careful making promises. I'm more hesitant to make promises because there were so many cases that I was not able to fulfill promises, or that even meeting times, I cannot meet that meeting time. I was late sometimes, and also I had to cancel the meeting and delay the meeting and so forth. So nowadays, before I make a promise, I make sure that I am able to fulfill this promise. But when I was younger, I made a numerous hasty promises and probably uh, to, from other people, I was uh, portrayed as an unreliable person. Now, as I came in as an EM pastor, Holy Spirit was uh, convicting me to fast for 21 days. Uh, when I did another 21 day fast about three or four years ago, towards the end of 21 day fast, God told me, you will have to do it again. And I said, oh, Lord, <laughs> when is it? <laughs> During my church plant era for about a year, when things did not go well according to my own plan, and I was constantly asking God, God, is this time that you want me to do a 21-day fast? But he repeatedly said, no, no. But immediately, as I was installed as a new EM pastor, the Holy Spirit convicted in my heart, now is the time. So uh, for the first few weeks, as I knew that I would be installed, and I am praying before God to prepare my heart, and as you remember, we had a joint worship with Pastor Han for inauguration, and he said, pray and fast. And that was a confirmation. Now, as I was sitting there, I was wrestling because I knew it was from the Lord. And I was thinking about starting the fast from April 1st. So that was uh, uh, my intention. But as soon as he said a fast, I felt like I need to proclaim this to entire congregation. Now... When I do that, before I made that proclamation, it's between I and God, you know. If I decide not to do oh, it's too difficult, Lord, I, I don't want to do it. And then I can kind of slide out of it kind of thing. But once you proclaim it to entire congregation, it's a sort of making promise to you. And if I end up not doing it, then even setting the beginning 
hey, you will not trust me and I will become unreliable pastor. So I had to make sure as I was sitting down there that, that by the grace of God that I will do it and, and go on. So after I made a, that proclamation, I, there was no way out. I had to keep the promise. So, <laughs> so today is my 19th day. I only have a two days left. I, I'm so looking forward to it again. <laughs> so as a people, sometimes because of our inability, we fail to keep promises. On the other hand, our God, He's an almighty God. He's an awesome God. He's a faithful God. So throughout the course of human history, He never has failed keeping His promise. And there are multiple promises in the future. Uh, for example, that Jesus will be returning back to us again. And that promise will be fulfilled in his due time. In his due time. So today, we want to talk about how our God, who is a promise keeper, that we can honor him with our life. Last week, with the more tangible items, like with our time, with our money, we want to honor our God. But today, we want to go into more of internal aspect of our Christian life, how we can honor our God. That is uh, through our faith. God gives us uh, promises to our life, individually and corporately. So our response is through faith that we can honor our God. Because even with the people, let's say someone is in a position with a great authority, and he says something to us, and if we neglect what he says, and if we do not trust what he says, then we are dishonoring that person. It's the same way with our God. He's almighty God, all-powerful. And he's a trustworthy, and he always keeps his promises. But our attitude, no matter how often, thousands of promises and our attitude towards his promises are like unbelief or neglecting them, that will be dishonoring our God. So in our life, a Christian life, faith is a tremendously important aspect. So by believing his promises, by trusting his promises, that we can honor our God. And that's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, we all know this Bible passage. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we can extend it. Without faith, it's impossible to honor our God. So when we come to him, that we must believe he is, and also he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So in our life, we want to respond to his promises by faith, and by faith that we can honor our God. Today's passage is about God giving promises to Abraham. And we want to take a look at this passage, how God came to Abraham and gave certain promises, and how Abraham responded with a faith, and he pleased God, and he honored God. As we know, Abraham was called by God from land of Ur, and he went to the land of promise, or land of Canaan, Without knowing exactly where to go, he was obedient to God. He was 75 years old already. Now, through the years, God intervened and God encountered Abraham a few times. Now, today's passage is chapter 15, verse 1 through 6. Before this happened, Abraham... It seems like his personalities are 
like a double personality. Because we know once, because of his wife, when he went down to Egypt, he was scared of his life, and he had to make his wife lie to the people in Egypt. So he was a coward. But later on, a few years later, Lot, his nephew, was captured by four different kings when they invaded Sodom and Gomorrah. And at the time, Lot was living in Sodom. So he was captured as a cap captive, and he was taken to the uh, region called Dan. And there, as he Abraham heard that news. What he did was he raised up his own servants, about 318 of them. And he took them and chased after these allies, four kings with a great army, and chased them until then. And he conquered them and rescued Lot and all the people and all the possession and returned back. And to me, these this Abraham seemed totally different people or person. But anyways, he won by the grace of God. So he returned. Then God appears to Abraham after the victory. So let's read the book of Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through 6. Let me read verse 1. It's because of my age. <laughs> After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. From this passage, we want to ask a few questions. What were some of God's promises? From this passage, we have two distinctive promises given to Abraham. First, promise was giving God himself to Abraham. Second one was that God will give him seed like stars, innumerable number of his seed will be in the future. Two distinctive promises. So first, God is giving himself to Abraham. And when he said that, the one, he said, fear not, Abraham, I, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So he says, I am your shield and I am your exceeding reward. And he said, I fear not. Why? Because, yes, he conquered four kings. However, he was frightened because these four kings might ally again and return to him and take a revenge. So he was frightened. And then God appears and says, fear not, I am your shield. God is our shield. And no matter how, what kind of fearful situation we are in, God will be always our protector. The weapons formed against us will not prevail. That is his promise. So no matter what happens in our life, by my mis mistake, by my own sins, that I might be into deep heat and in a situation that is so frightening that I cannot see forward and backward anywhere, but always upward with open, 
the window of heaven is always open and God is ready to hear our voices and He's ready to protect us and He's our shield. If God gave His only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to demolish the power of death and death was reigning over us and all the bottom line, the foundation, source of our fears are death. But Jesus destroyed it. And our God says, not only to Abraham, to you and I, I am your shield. I am your protector. No matter what happens in your situation, by your own mistake or by your enemies, they do not matter. No matter what happens, I'll be your shield. That's what he says to Abraham. And secondly, that he says, I am exceeding, you are exceeding reward. Now, he is not saying, I am exceeding rewarder. In other words, giver. The person who gives gifts. Yes, our God is a rewarder. According to what we do, he is a just and righteous God. So he repays for the goods that we have done before God. So he gives us all the treasures and all the blessings in our life. But also, more than that, God himself is our greatest reward. Because all the external gifts will not last long. We may ask for house. We may ask for promotion in our job. We may ask for power. You may ask for fame or new car or better grade at school. They will not give us a sustaining joy and true satisfaction. You know, there's a saying. If you have a new car, you are happy for one week. If you have a new house, you are happy for about three months. And if you have a new wife, you are happy for about a year. Except mine lasts for nine years. <laughs> I need to be careful here. <laughs> All these external things, God gives them to us. However, we know there's a void in our soul. There's an emptiness in our heart that can be only filled by the presence of God, by God himself. Because God created us as a communal being. Unless we intimately commune with our God, there will be no true sustaining satisfaction in our heart. External things will not satisfy us. And that's why God comes to Abraham and says, I am your exceeding reward. Our God is greatest gift and reward for our life. And that's why we are encouraging you to come to Thresh Dias. Because there, we're not going to give you an iPod. We're not going to give you a laptop. We're not going to give you external things. Well, we may. But the only thing is we are creating and preparing a way so that God can invade us, God can come to us. And as a first-timer and as a candidate, you encounter God and you receive God himself as your own gift and your life will be transformed. You'll be so happy. You'll be so happy. And you'll be like me. It was better than your own honeymoon. Our God himself is the greatest reward. Let's not forget that. And that's what he said to Abraham. He promised, I'll be your shirt and I'll be your exceeding reward. Then second promise is, he took out Abraham, it was probably a night, and he bid him to look up to the sky. Look at the stars. Nowadays, at night, we lift up our heads to the sky. We cannot barely see many, many stars because of smokes and all these things. 
But back then, we're talking about 4,000 years ago, probably you look up the sky, it would be packed with the stars. Innumerable. You cannot count them. So, he says, this will be your seed. That's my promise. But that time, Abraham even didn't have a son. He's already probably by now about 80 or 85 years old. And God is saying, look at the sky and look at the stars. That's how much your descendants will be. And that is a tremendous promise. Now, we want to ask four questions on this area and to see how God worked and how Abraham responded. And we want to dig deeper to understand and, and catch some biblical principles that we can apply to our own life. First question is, what was the initial attitude of Abraham when God appeared to him? He was a little bit complaining, murmuring, because he says on verse 2, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. Abraham is complaining. God, it's you who did not give me a seed. You did not give me a son. Now, by this time, look at Abraham. He was so much blessed by God. He has a tremendous possession. As he was returning back to Canaan from Egypt, he received all kinds of possessions. He had more servant. Look at it. Trained a servant. He had a 318. He was a very rich man. And also recently in a battle, he was a victorious. He had a tremendously beautiful wife. Even she's grandma and King Pharaoh coveted after her. I wonder when I go up to heaven, how she will look like. She will be probably better looking than Miss Universe. And uh, I don't know whether the daughters of Job are prettier or Sarah is a prettier. And of course, don't get offended. My wife will be the most beautiful woman up there. <laughs> he was blessed in and out. In and out. But he's still complaining. Why? Because he doesn't have a son. This is our attitude too. God blesses us with so many things. So many items God answered our prayers. But things we do not possess right now, we come before God and we begin to murmur and complain. That's our attitude. Just like in the Garden of Eden, how was Adam and Eve? They have a luxurious and fancy trees with a probably very delicious fruits. If not 10,000 different trees or fruits, probably 100,000 different trees in the Garden of Eden. However, just one tree they cannot eat, that stews out in their eyes, and they're being tempted by Satan. That's how we are. It's our sinful nation. It's with our relationships too, with our spouse. When we look at our wife and when we look at our husband, they have so many positive aspects. But one habit that irritates you, this one negative aspect that is bothering you, and we complain towards our spouse. It's the same thing with any kind of relationships. We are like that. We are like that. But we need to train ourselves to think and have this perspective and always remind ourselves the good things God has already given us as gifts and his blessing. 
And if we begin to touch that tree in the center of Garden of Eden, it brings death. Even between spouses, if we bring up the negative aspect of our spouse and we begin to fight, then we lose joy and peace in our family. That's Abraham has this attitude. But on the positive side is because no matter how many blessings you have, because God has instilled in our heart as human beings that we want to multiply. It's in our gene. So it's a natural thing to have our descendants and have our children. So that's why he's begging God, God, you didn't give me a son, so please allow me to have this son. He's talking about physical son, but how about us? How about us? Do we have any spiritual son in our life that we are agonizing over and before God? If I am Christian for 20 years or 30 years, if I was born in Christian family, and examine your life right now. How many spiritual sons and daughters do you have and do we have? Because Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. It's God's will as the disciples of Jesus Christ to be fruitful. Not only in, with the internal fruits, but external fruits as well. We are to go and preach the gospel, share the love of Christ, and bring them into church and bring them to Christ and make them disciples of Jesus Christ. That's a spirit, it's a desire. There's a tremendous longing in our heart, whether we recognize it or not. As a Christian, I believe there are two tremendous longings in our heart. First is the presence of God. We long for His presence. His presence will only satisfy us. And secondly, because we are God's children and because that mandate is already upon our life, that we have this longing that we want to see the power of gospel portrayed through the course of our life. And when that doesn't happen, when there's no fruit, then there's a dissatisfaction. It's the same with me. Pastor is no different. I've been Christian for 20 years. I cannot count the number of people that I evangelized and caused them to accept Christ as a Savior, but I believe it's well over thousands. But still, in me, there's a longing, there's a hunger for spiritual babies, for spiritual children to make a disciples of Jesus Christ and to evangelize and preach the gospel. I still feel like I am a barren woman, that I cannot bear spiritual baby, that I really want to see non-believers coming to Christ and become disciples of Jesus Christ. If that is our longing, just like Abraham, we ought to go before God and content with him and ask God, Lord, Lord, multiply. Lord, cause me to conceive your spiritual children. Use me. That should be our longing and our prayer and our complaint. Not only just things external that we ask God, but that's something relating to expanding the kingdom of God. Second question we like to ask is, how did God help Abraham to believe his promise? How did God help Abraham to believe his promise that he will have a multitude of descendants? He took Abraham out in dark night and caused him to see up the sky and look at the stars. By seeing him beforehand will help our faith. Just like the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, 
Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. In other words, in our reality, in our present life, we don't see that. Abraham was not able to see that. But God helped him to see the star. You cannot count them. That many, I will bless you with your children. So God helped him to see the future by faith. So faith is the evidence that things are not seen. So as we pray, in our mind, we picture for what God has promised me for the future. It's not happening right now. Circumstances are quite opposite to what God has promised me. But I look forward in faith and I pray to God, God, you promised me and fulfill that promise by seeing the future that will happen because God always fulfilled his promise. And that's why in Old Testament, the prophets were oftentimes called seers because they saw the future. The prophets, when they received the vision, how do they record in the Bible what God has spoken to them? They received the vision, visual aspects of the future, and they record it. That's how God helps our faith. Look at Joseph. Joseph was born in the family of nomad. He was not a farmer. In his house, there were only sheep and goats and probably some cows. However, the contents of his dream when he was 17 years old was what? The sheaves rose up and bowed before his own sheep. That's crops. That's agriculture. Nothing to do with goats or sheep. And second dream was stars will bow down before his own star. What did this content help Joseph to sustain through the persecution and sufferings and to hold on to the promise and vision God has given to him. He was a servant and slave in the house of Potiphar. And Potiphar had a field. He had a farming. As a servant, he went out and did agriculture. So when you gather crops, what do you do? You bundle them with the sheaves. And every time he is working in the field and he sees the sheaves, he's reminded of the promise of God, the dream God has given to him. Someday this will happen to be true. Someday God will fulfill this dream. And he worked all night long. He's returning back to his own dormitory. He looks up to the sky. What do you see? Stars. And he is a reminder of his own dream. Stars bind down before him. Lord, I am a slave right now. However, someday you will fulfill my dream. That's how he kept going on. That's how God helped us. It's always like that. It's always like that. So even... We need to train ourselves mentally and spiritually, picture ourselves, the promise and vision God has given us for the future. We look ahead. When we raise our children, it's the same way. As we pray for each child, we look for their future. What kind of future do you want your son and daughter to behold? You picture it, you see it in the future, and you ask God in detail. I want my son to grow up like this way, really praising you and totally committed for the sake of gospel and be used and become influential to his own generation and to his society. And you picture it, dream it, and pray for that son and daughter. Singers, it's the same thing. 
You pray for future spouse. You picture it in your heart. What kind of marriage life would you like to have? Together, worshiping God, being used mightily by God. It's important whom you choose, but it's more important how you live. So when you are single, even though it's difficult to picture it, but you picture your marriage life, that you are really at peace, happy, serving the Lord together, and having many, many children. You picture them and you pray and ask God. Bill McCarthy, when I went to college, I went to University of Colorado at Boulder. I was an electrical engineering major. At the time, late 1980s, um, Bill MacArthur was a football coach. Our football team was a Buffalo. And once or twice, I think, at that time, we were an Orange Bowl. I didn't know because I, didn't, I was not Christian at that time. And he was a devout Christian, apparently. He was a coach. And we had a stadium called the Folsom Stadium. And whenever he engaged a football game, he pictured all these men drinking beer, yelling, cheering for over stupid football game, and wanted to have God together, men, to this stadium, and worship God together, and hear God together, and totally surrender their lives for the sake of Jesus. And he always imagined in his heart and pictured it. He was only football coach, college football coach. Then his dream came about to be true. He began an organization called the Promise Keepers. And in 1994, historically, by that time in America, in Washington Mall, there were, they say, they guesstimated about over a million men got together. Historically, there was most the number of men got together in any setting. But he saw the future. Four years ago, when I was in interim pastor of EM, and KM side, they were constructing business center. So we decided to help out a little bit because we'll be inheriting this uh, miracle center for free. So we wanted to kind of raise fund from our own congregation, kind of show them appreciation. So at that time, there was um, a brother, his name was Tim Babinski. And one Sunday, he was encouraging the congregation. You know, um, they are building the vision center and will be inheriting this uh, MC uh, main sanctuary for free. So let's uh, appreciate them and let's uh, uh, really uh, pray and uh, gather our money uh, to give them and support. And when he was uh, saying that, he said, you know, imagine yourself that we are, we are in the high school room worshiping back then. Imagine yourself, Pastor Shine, go down in the main sanctuary and you will see his face on the screen and we'll be worshiping God in that sanctuary. And when he said that, I said to myself, man, I'm just the interim pastor and by the time that happens that I'll be probably going back to KM or something. But apparently, his faith prevailed. You see my face on the screen. <laughs> God helps us to see the future, to fulfill his promise. Third question that I would like to ask is, why doesn't God give us time when that promise will be fulfilled? Many, many promises in the Bible he hardly gives us time. 
We don't know exactly what year, what month that Jesus will be returning back to us. Why is it? Why is it when he promises us, he doesn't give us a time? Abraham, right before his 100th birthday, a year before God appeared us again and said, time, like next year, you will have a son. That was it, right before the conception. But other than that, he's not giving us time. Why is it? Why is it that God doesn't give us time when he makes promise? I believe it is because he is trying to create in us patience. Patience. We are interested in our gifts, receiving gifts from God, external things. But God is more interested with our internal things, our character, building us to be like Christ. So without giving us a time that we need to be really patient, we need to diligently go before God and ask God and pray. And that communion, God enjoys us. And not only that, as we wait, we wait, there's a patience formed in our heart. All of us, no matter whether you are American, Korean, Chinese, doesn't matter. All of us are impatient by nature. But our God in Old Testament, when he introduces himself, he, the first description of God he says, our God is a long-suffering God. And our God is love. And in New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, love is patient. So God creates us. God forms us within our character, patience. Patience. The gift, answer to our prayer, does not come to our own time schedule. It's according to his divine time and due time, he answers our prayers and he keeps his promise. Along the way, we become patient person. Why is the patience so important in our life? Waiting in the line in, at Starbucks at 7 a.m. or go to McDonald's that you wave. Those are just some mundane things. That's not even regarded as a patient. We need patience towards one another. With the people, we need a patience. God is a patient God. God is a long-suffering God. And He has patiently waited for us to receive Christ as a Savior. And He's still waiting for us to be mature Christian. He's still waiting and long-suffering and be patient. And God sends us as His ambassadors that means we need to deal with other people. When we deal with other people, unless we are patient, we cannot evangelize, we cannot make a disciples of Jesus Christ. His main concern for the church is evangelism and discipleship. You and I, we received that mandate. And to fulfill that mandate, the character-wise, unless we are patient, we can never be successful in bringing one soul, one brother to Christ or make one person disciples of Jesus Christ. For us to be sitting here, somebody and some people have been patiently ministered us. Some people patiently nurtured us and waited for us. And that's why for 25 years, Abraham had to wait along the way he became man of patience. That's why he doesn't give us time. I believe that's the main reason. And lastly, how did Abraham overcome his circumstances and himself? To take it as a faith that God approved him, his decision to believe his promise that innumerable multitude of descendants God will give me. And he took it. Faith is a choice, is a decision. So he decided to believe his promise. But two items he had to overcome. One is himself. Two is his circumstances. It's the same thing. 
Same principle applies to everyday life as a Christian. We have to battle with ourselves and our situations. The reason why we neglect God's promise is because we are consumed by our flaws and we are consumed by our situations. And that's why we cannot grab His promise. We cannot hold on to His word. First, Abraham had to overcome his, himself. He's about 85 years old. There's no way, no way he can have a child. He can have a child. He's been probably married over 50 years. For 50, last 50 years, there was no sign of conception from Sarah. And there will be a difference in the future. I'm much getting older. My body is like that one. We all have a flaws. We made mistakes. We sinned before. And we failed before multiple times. And we are entangled by our own flaws, mistakes, and failures. And we have no strength to grab upon his promise. So we give up right then. We don't even think about it. Oh, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. Second thing Abraham had to overcome was his own situation. Look at his wife. For himself, he already had a dead body. And issue of women has stopped with Sarah. Look at the circumstances. It's impossible. I cannot even have one son. What are you talking about? Stars? No. But he had to make a choice. By overcoming himself, by overcoming the situation, he chose to take promise of God, and it was imputed to righteousness. And Abraham honored God. It's always like that. It was always like that. But even though Abraham grabbed and made that choice, the decision was instant, and God honored it, and God took it. Just like when we accepted Jesus Christ, it's an instant decision, and we accept Christ as Savior, and we are eternally saved, and that salvation will never shatter and never be fluctuated. However, our faith, after I became Christian, after I made a, that sinner's prayer, time to time I was doubtful. Am I really saved? We are like that. However, that one time decision, we hold on to it and we persevere. Yes, we are weak. We will have some fluctuation along the way. Just like Abraham, some years later, his faith wavered. And he ended up sleeping with Hagar and had Ismael. And that caused a tremendous headache. But yet, he made that choice and decision. Even though he also made mistakes along the way, God was helping him and worked with him to sustain his faith. Going to TD, look at your job take a vacation out, it looks impossible, and come up with a debt fee, or even going to short-term mission with a schedule and money, all these, we look at the situation and we give up. However, if we overcome, I am doing things that are pleasing to God, and I make a decision, and I ask God to move my situation, then God will move his situation, because we are holding on to it. Is a promise. By faith, we can honor God. Our God is the promise keeper. Let's honor him with our faith. Let's pray together. Can we ask all the people to stand up?
what are the circumstances in your own life you are not responding by faith, but you are just going along with the wave of situation and circumstances. Let's ask God to strengthen our faith. Whatever vision God has given you, have a picture in your mind, in your heart. Look forward and ask God to fulfill that dream. Do you wish to be a Christian businessman and woman? Do you want to raise a healthy and happy family? Do you want your children to be successful and be really impacting the kingdom of God? Do you want to be missionary? Do you want to be a praise leader? In what capacity? Don't give up by looking at your own talent, your flaw, and your previous failure. Look unto God and hold on to His promise. Anything you pray in my name, I will do it, Jesus said. I am your shield. I am your exceeding reward. If you diligently seek me in faith, I am the rewarder. I will reward you, not because of your performance, but because by faith you sought after me. So if we can cry at Jesus a few times and pray and ask God, Lord, help me to believe and trust and strengthen my faith. Let's call on Jesus a few times. One, two, three. Jesus! Jesus! Jesus!